In British Columbia, research studies have clearly demonstrated that the growth of many coniferous stands is being inhibited by a lack of sufficient nitrogen and that the use of urea as a source of nitrogen is a viable silvicultural practice in coastal British Columbia forests. In the interior, lodgepole pine and even Douglas fir stands with nutrient deficiencies are showing significant growth responses when fertilized. Due to access, topography and ground conditions, fertilization in British Columbia's forests must be undertaken by aerial methods with contracts being awarded to private airline companies who have the appropriate equipment, expertise, and the proper licensing to enable them to carry out effective applications. The versatility and maneuverability of helicopters have made this aircraft the main type utilized in British Columbia. In the interest of economies of scale, large areas are selected for aerial operations with significant expenditures involved. It is therefore imperative that appropriate stands are selected, taking into account a number of biological factors. The implementation must be well planned, with due consideration of operational factors, and of course wood supply and management objectives properly evaluated. For the five interior regions, in developing aerial fertilization projects, silviculture staff are required to use the Interior Fertilization Guidelines in a three-step decision-making process in order to properly rank the stands. The first step considers biological factors and takes into account the species with preference given to pure or mixed lodgepole pine stands on medium or poor sites and which are neither moisture deficient nor moisture excessive. The stands must have been spaced to a three to four meter inter-tree distance or be planned for spacing within one year of fertilizing or are at the target density through natural means. These stands should be in the 20 to 60 year age range, crown condition, foliage color, and the potential for insect, disease, or mammal damage should be given consideration in the biological factors. Changes in squirrel or snowshoe hare populations affect the expected severity of tree damage. Nitrogen status and other minor element deficiencies can be ascertained from a foliar analysis. Those stands that are biologically acceptable must then be evaluated by operational factors. Key items include distance from railhead, access to heliports or airstrips, availability of storage areas for fertilizer, and sufficient space for the parking and loading of large trucks. Slopes in excess of 40 percent are not recommended for aerial fertilization. Project and block shapes and sizes have significant bearing on the ease and cost of operations. Thus, small areas and those with irregular boundaries require particular attention in operational planning and are generally a lower priority. The primary purpose of the spacing and fertilizing treatments is to concentrate the growth potential of a site onto pre-selected numbers of trees to produce merchantable diameters in a shorter time. Thus. Wood supply factors such as annual allowable cut, fall down, size or age class distribution, and proximity to conversion facilities are further considerations in the ranking process. To properly analyze all these factors, detailed field examinations are essential. It's important for the contractor to look closely at the present road network in the area and assess its condition since the contractor is responsible for any upgrading required to accommodate truck traffic for the fertilization operation. Owing to the high volatilization of urea fertilizer under warm conditions, the operation is usually carried out in the fall during cool, moist periods. Therefore, poor road conditions must be anticipated. Wet weather can deteriorate an otherwise adequate road. Culverts and bridges need to be checked for soundness and turnaround space for large trucks considered. Suitable areas must be located for temporary storage of the bulk fertilizer. Landing sites are identified and upgrading needs 
such as the removal of any tall trees or brush noted. The final locations for the helispots are determined after award by the successful contractor, who is aware of the landing and takeoff requirements of his particular aircraft. Proposed blocks are mapped out and checked for any treatment needed. A significant factor in fertilization of lodgepole stands is to ensure that space stands are selected to account for the rapid increase in crown mass. Usual recommendations of 3 by 3 meter spacing are better expanded to 4 by 4 meters in fertilization prescriptions. Proposed fertilization sites should be reviewed with other users of the land, with particular attention given to the areas that are used for cattle grazing, domestic water supply, fish habitat, and research trials. Livestock should be excluded from grazing areas during fertilization. Water bodies and research areas usually require untreated buffer zones left around them. Once sites have been selected and ranked, a proposal is made to the regional office showing the blocks identified with access and distances described and a list of all the areas. The regional office coordinates the district proposals, develops specifications, advertises the contract, arranges viewing times with the districts and makes the contract award. Upon notification of the award, the successful contractor will contact the district staff involved to obtain maps and aerial photos showing the layout and boundaries for the blocks to be treated. Access and helispots are finalized and any upgrading or new construction requirements are arranged for. District staff will advise and assist in identifying and marking the stand boundaries and corners with the contractor. District staff are also responsible for liaison with the public and other agencies concerning restricted access during the aerial operation. Signs must be prepared to properly warn of low-flying aircraft and advise them of the road closures adjacent to the landing areas. It's necessary to define acceptable standards of accuracy in fertilization application and to monitor the contractor's performance under field conditions. Specifications normally call for use of urea with 46% nitrogen content on the coast, 40% nitrogen and 12% sulfur in the interior, applied at the rate of 435 kilograms per hectare. To provide sufficiently uniform distribution, fertilizer is spread in overlapping swaths. The specified swath overlap is usually 50%. Four factors determine the actual application rate. Drop rate, airspeed, swath width, and swath overlap percentage. It's possible to maintain drop rate and airspeed at a constant level, whereas swath width and overlap may be more variable. Application rates can be determined by two methods by setting out sample traps of a known surface area, and also by measuring the four factors that control the application rate. Methodology has been developed for both methods, and operational plans must provide for one of these to properly monitor the contractor. At the present time, there are two main types of delivery systems being used in the province. The bagging delivery system for large helicopters and direct delivery for smaller aircraft. Both delivery systems are required to use a transponder navigation system that guides the pilot to the starting point and along the flight lines. The hardware consists of a set of two ground transponders that are set out at strategic locations near the block being treated. The units are battery-powered transmitters that send out signals which are picked up by a receiving unit in the helicopter. The signal is processed into a measurement of distance from the helicopter to the two transponders. Using computer triangulation, the location of the helicopter is accurately calculated. The aircraft flies to the two opposite corners of the block, and the computer logs the location coordinates for future reference. Using pre-calculated speed, altitude, and spreader data, the pilot enters the swath width interval. The computer now calculates and indicates to the pilot where to start and end each run, and triangulates his position indicating whether or not he's lined up on the correct run. If the spreader empties in the middle of a run, the pilot logs in a stop point to be picked up on return. Stop points can also be used to give indicators for any buffers during the runs. 
When the end of a run is reached, the computer will calculate the next swath line location automatically. The bagging delivery system starts with either rail or truck delivery of bulk forestry grade fertilizer in pellet form to a loading site. The site must be large enough to accommodate the stored bags, loading equipment, and the bulk delivery trucks. With this system, the fertilizer is loaded into ripstop nylon bags, which have a plastic liner inserted inside them. The bags are placed under a hopper, which is loaded by a conveyor belt directly from the bulk truck. The bags are filled to match the load capacity of the helicopter, in this case, 3,000 pounds. They are then moved to a storage area. It is the contractor's responsibility to ensure that any spills are promptly cleaned up and no other debris or materials left at any of the loading sites. This must be carefully monitored by district staff. Close to the time of operations, the bags are loaded onto trucks to be transported to the individual landing storage areas, which are usually within one or two kilometers of the blocks to be treated. Security is a prime concern of the contractor since the bags are vulnerable to vandalism once they're stored at the project site. In the bagging system of delivery, the helicopter presently being used is a Bell 205 with a spreader bucket slung from the cargo hook. The spreader has a remote control door which can be opened and closed by the pilot, thus controlling the flow of the fertilizer. A variable speed power impeller is located in the spreader to disperse the pellets during flight. The bags are picked up by a modified front end loader and the plastic liner is cut open dumping the pellets into the hopper. The helicopter moves into position and sets the spreader on the ground, and the loader operator dumps the load into the spreader. The helicopter lifts off, and the loader repeats the process. The pilot ferries the load to the block, and using his navigation system, lines up the next swath. The spreader is opened and continues until the end of the swath is reached, or the spreader is empty. The end of the run is recorded into the computer and the helicopter returns to be refilled. When fuel is needed or maintenance required, the pilot sets the spreader down and lands beside it. This delivery system carries 3,000 pounds of fertilizer per run and has been in use for several years in the province. With the support crew of five, the required equipment on site, and the large landing area required for the Bell 205, suitable working space is a necessity. Fuel tanks, fertilizer bags, vehicles and people all make it mandatory to have safe working sites for the helicopters taking off and landing with loads of fertilizer, yet close enough to the block being treated to minimize the ferry distance. When the bags are all used at a landing site, the equipment is moved to the next location and the empty bags return to the loading site to be refilled. Setup time for this system is approximately 20 to 30 minutes. The direct delivery system uses the smaller Hughes 500 or the Bell 206. Either helicopter carries a similar spreader, but with a 1,000 pound capacity. The fertilizer is delivered to the nearest railhead location or bulk truck destination, where it is loaded into a modified grain delivery truck for transport to the operation site. On arrival at the site, the driver sets up the hopper on the back of the truck, which is loaded with an auger, to the prescribed weight. The pilot slings the spreader under the hopper while the operator empties the load and the helicopter takes off on the next run. These trucks hold approximately 25 spreader loads of fertilizer, and a team of them can provide a continuous supply, assuming that the railhead or truck destination they're working from is not too far from the operational area. This delivery system is very versatile, as the smaller helicopter can use tighter landing areas, such as the one seen here on a wider section of road. This allows trucks to be moved at any time to a location closer to the block being worked on, thus reducing the ferry time. A transponder navigation system is used similar to those on the larger aircraft. The district staff must ensure that monitoring includes the procuring of water samples where required within or near the fertilization area, and the checking of buffer zones. With both systems, the prescribed application of fertilizer is evenly spread over the block by overlapping swaths. 
The spreader sends out a parabolic-shaped swath of pellets as the helicopter moves along each line. Monitoring of the flight paths and flying procedures will help to avoid any areas being overtreated, which may result in too high a concentration of fertilizer in that area of the block. High crosswinds may also cause the fertilizer to drift unevenly along the swath line. Weather conditions during the operational period are important to the success of the operation. Firstly, the helicopter cannot accurately spread the fertilizer if the wind makes it difficult to keep on the swath lines. Also, the safety of the pilot is of concern, since the aircraft is flying with a full load at very low altitudes. Visibility is also a factor, with fog or low cloud shutting down the flying. These possible delays should be reckoned on in planning the staff time needed to monitor the operation. Post-treatment activities include records of weather conditions in the area after the project and a thorough check of all the loading sites to assure any spills have been properly cleaned up. A stand tending report must be compiled and appropriate entries made in the history record system for future reference. Growth and yield plots may be established in the project area to provide growth response data for improving future operations. This data will also be helpful in assessing when the next treatment is needed and any interim stand improvements required. Records including block layouts, access and landing locations, and treatment statistics will be useful as a basis for organizing future fertilization projects. The cost of aerial fertilization is expressed as cents per kilogram for fertilizer delivered on the block. Both delivery systems are competitive and, with improvements and modifications resulting from research and operational experience, will continue to have an important role in stand improvement. The effective exercise of responsibilities by the Forest Service staff involved in all phases of aerial fertilization projects can have a major impact on ensuring that a high quality of performance is maintained in a cost-effective manner.